This is the Veterinary Chiropractic Lecture given by Dr. William Inman on the 27th of December 1996. It's to coincide with the Animal Chiropractic Seminar, Small Animal Module, given throughout the year of 1997. This will be an actual demonstration on activator points and how to apply VOM done on a skeleton. We'll be using a number of different types of approaches. We'll be also using some X-radiographic uh, demonstrations in this regard. And in some ways, we'll be able to slim down to some degree our subject. And in some times, we can stretch out our subject. Nonetheless, we'll apply as much data as we can in a fashion to allow you to be able to see the points on the skeleton and apply them to the actual patient. tools that we'll be using in this regard will be a number of the, the skeleton of course, the activator instrument which is depicted as such, which is the device developed by Arlen 4 and who's been using that for activator methods for the last 20 years, and a simple device for uh, percussion for reflexes. We will be examining pressure points and points of interest throughout the spinal vertebra, points in the skull, points down the spinal cord, depicted in yellow dots, our, our pressure points are points where the activator device is actually applied. These points will be applied along uh, various aspects of the external uh, part of the animal's body in such a fashion as to reduce the subluxation. Uh, these points are, like I say, depicted in yellow. Hello, and welcome to my home in Seattle, Washington, where there's about 10 or 15 inches of snow and nobody can go anywhere. Today I'm going to try to go over with my poor dog, Yorick, the um, aspects of veterinary orthopedic manipulation, diagnostic, and therapeutic pass. We'll be going over the various points of my dog and I'll be trying to show you the uh, activator points, the VOM points, and where potential disease conditions occur and subluxations occur. It's my intention to try to uh, entertain you and describe to you in an actual fashion how you can go about applying this veterinary orthopedic manipulation technique in your practice. So let's get started. The activator device, <coughs> this device, is, was adjusted or was developed by Arnold Four of uh, Activator Methods and is a means of spinal thrusting in the animal's body at various points. The yellow points depicted along the animal's back, of course, are the areas where we actually make the contact points. They correspond to various areas in the body. They're actually easily palpated and we find them in those fashion uh, by going down and palpating the spots and then applying an activator thrust to that particular spot. The activator instrument can be used with an adjunct. This particular instrument has a cervical adjunct that goes on the end of it and can be used. Sometimes I prefer not to. You can buy an activator instrument that, in fact, has um, a device that you can add to the end of it. And then also we can use a percussive instrument sometimes, too, if we're looking for various points, etc. So let's go through what would be a basic VOM activator pass, and a pass that would uh, determine whether or not we're dealing with um, a subluxation. This is what we would do on any animal that we were going to um, uh, go through and diagnose. Now the activator adjustment always begins in the front part of the body, the rostral part of the body, and that will occur at the atlanto-occipital junction. There are three different positions in the atlanto-occipital junction. I'll show those to you in more detail in a second. There are three areas where you can contact as far as contact points for the adjustment. The line of drive I'll show you in just a moment too. The reason there's three different points is that some animals are too small to get the activator device into the atlanto-occipital junction per se. And so what we do is we first adjust the atlanto-occipital junction and then everything else caudal to that is then taken care of. You go all the way through to the back end of the dog and then you start at the front end of the dog again. You'll go through a diagnostic pass, then a therapeutic pass, then maybe subsequent therapeutic passes until your activator adjustment pro approach is complete. With the dog positioned in a fashion to where we're able to have it 
the dog restrained in some fashion. Um, we're able to have somebody hold on to the dog from the other side. I pretend to adjust the dog almost always from the dog's left side. I'm a left-handed veterinarian, but I seem to use my right hand to hold the activator device. You hold it in actual fashion, like this, and apply the thrust like this. In an activator pass, however, we'll very commonly use it turned on two rings. Um, when you start using the activator device and start applying it to animals, as far as diagnostic passes go, you may want to turn it up until you get used to it. But I find that um, for the, the purposes of making the activator pass and also the diagnostic pass and therapeutic passes too, that I very often will use only about two rings. But it's a matter of personal preference. I've noticed that um, chiropractors will use anywhere from this thing full on to almost all the way shut down and still get adequate results. Um, in, in, all of, in every case though, however, it would seem that less is always more. So the first activator pass puts the uh, line of drive from the uh, contact point to the contralateral ear. It took us a long time to figure out this line of drive, almost four years before we finally figured out what was actually occurring in the Atlantic occipital junction. But this is where you do. If you can get it into the occiput, you would place it here, and you drive it towards not the cochlear opening, which would be here on the other side, but rather you drive it towards where the pinna of the ear is on the dog, which is going to be about up here. So the drive is actually forward and up. And so you come in underneath the dog like this, and you activate the dog like that. And then your next step, their next step will be the contralateral aspect. And you go over on the other side. Let me jump to this side over here. You go to the other side and make the other adjustment like this. Then, very important, the atlanto occipital junction is not adjusted until you make this final move, and that is on the second vertebral dorsal spinous process of the second ver uh, cervical vertebra, you adjust it right here and push that down. I'll show you for a minute what that actually does. Now, this sets up the whole diagnostic pass for the rest of the dog. I'm going to go through the diagnostic pass now for the rest of the dog, just so you have an idea of what it looks like. After you've made that, those adjustments and noted whether or not you have subluxation, you move to the caudal aspect of the dorsal wing of the axis, and you adjust it. And then you go to the third, the dorsal spinous process of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Now I'm at the seventh, and we'll go to the seventh one right here. Now. When we're going to do C8, which there is, no, there is no eighth cervical vertebra, but we're going to do the section that just follows C8, we're going to actually put that pressure on the, first, the dorsal spinous process of the first thoracic vertebra, and we're going to actually push it back right in here like this. So that's the adjustment for C8. Now, the adjustment for T1 will be right here. Okay. And then as we go through, we will go through the adjustments for the subsequent thoracic vertebra, uh, two, three, four, et cetera, as we go down through here. It's interesting to note that very commonly, we don't have a whole lot of subluxations that occur from T2 uh, through T5, to, or six or seven. But then when seven or eight picks up, which is about right in here, we start to find subluxations. And so the line of drive here is interesting because as you're Moving down through here, you have a tendency to move in this direction, like this. Notice that the, 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 the angle of the dorsal spinous process point starts to point back as we go through. And we're trying to drive straight down the vertebral, I'm sorry, the dorsal spinous process. And so we're straight on here. Remember, you were like here for C8, but T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8, T9, T10, etc back to where we're almost straight up and down at the anticlinal vertebra, which is T13, the 13th thoracic vertebra, which, of course, has the one with the last rib on it. And that is also called the anticlinal vertebra. Very commonly, you'll get subluxations all in through this area. And it'll probably skip L2-3 and go to 3-4, and 4-5 will very commonly get subluxations. Now, as we move into the caudal back, you'll notice that you'll start to move straighter up, you're straight up and down at the anticlinal vertebra, which is 13, and you move um, more st straight up until you're almost pointing a little bit forward. Now, notice the angle of the proximal or the uh, rostral aspect of the dorsal spinous process. It's almost straight up and down as you go back. 
So basically, it's towards the center. The line of drive is towards the center of the Earth past the 13th thoracic vertebra. So you're essentially like this all the way back. And so you go all the way back until you finally fall into the in-between the area, in-between the uh, wings of the ilium, and you adjust the sacral vertebra down to about this point. Now, you can adjust the tail, but poor Yurik, he's lost his tail over the last several years of me adjusting him. And the tail adjustments usually don't have a whole lot of import. However, they can pre create other problems further up upstream. And they can indicate, too, that we're dealing with another problem, a problem that um, is reflected in further up in the body if you have subluxation down there, but we'll leave that for later. In the meantime, to finish the diagnostic path, you will place um, a motion into the wing of the ilium on one side, the wing of the ilium on the other side, then you come up under the ischial area and adjust that area, moving it straight along the length of the, of the um, hemipelvis, like this, click, at the, at the point of the butt, which you can feel in this dog, and on the other side, and then you will have made your diagnostic pass. You will have seen whatever reads that you would have seen. Now, one question is, people say, well, are you going to put a motion or are you going to put a diagnostic question into each and every vertebral dorsal spinous process? In some cases, yes. In a lot of cases, no. You know not, you, that you're not going to find a whole lot from T2 to T6 or 7, so you really don't have to worry about that area a whole lot unless you have a question about that area. And also, as you go through, you can find areas that are hot spots, and you can zero in a little bit better as you move down through the uh, activator pass to determine what's going on. Now, so you will have made it through a diagnostic pass, and in that diagnostic pass, you will have completed uh, and uh, recorded the potential uh, reads that you had, and now you're going to go back through and see if you can get those reduced. Now, let's say you've made through your diagnostic pass, and now you're ready to make a therapeutic pass. What you're going to do is you're going to repeat the similar diagnostic pass using almost the same exact setting that you had on your, on your technique or on your device, and move through in the same exact fashion. If you started on the right, you start on the right. I, of course, start on the left, and so we start on the left, and we always start from the occipital junction. Sometimes you cannot get into the uh, atlanto-occipital junction in this tubercle, and you have to take the wing of the atlas, and that's also going to work. Any three of these points are the same thing. And so you adjust here and here on the other side, like this, and then you complete the adjustment of the atlas by coming down on the dorsal aspect of the axis, like that, and then you go down through here. And let's say you had a subluxation at this point, but it's not there anymore. That means that, of course, it's adjusted. You note that and you continue, and you move through here. Now, you didn't find anything or think that there was anything involved in that area. You can skip that area and go right to the next read. You've got a read, for instance, at T12. And so you go back down to T12, and you find out, yep, it still reads. Okay? So if it still reads, you put another motion into it and then continue on. And so you've had an, at a, at a, a read, for instance, at L45, and you find out that L4-5, sure enough, you've got a read there, and you put a motion into that, put another motion, and find out it's gone. It's been successfully reduced. If you put a motion into it, click. You, you got a read originally. This is on your second diagnostic pass. You find that it still reads. You put a motion into it, and it still reads. You put a third motion into it, and it still reads. Leave it alone. It's been moved enough. It's adjusted. You can't hurt the animal by continuing to whack away at the dog this way, but you can, what you're doing is you're just irritating the nerve and it's not going to, to reduce. It's not going to appear to have been reduced or the reflexive response is not going to remove. What you're looking for is the reflexive response that is indicative of subluxation. And we'll show you that on some of the other videos that we have. And then you move back down and you complete your subluxation reduction therapeutic pass. The therapeutic pass number one has been completed, and you know what those results are. Then you will make sometimes a third and a fourth diagnostic pass. I'm sorry, a therapeutic pass. And they go in the same fashion. You go click, on the other side click here, and you go back down. Now you're only taking on spots that you know are hot spots, so you don't have to fool with any of the area in the middle of the neck. You had a read here and it's gone. You're going to check it. Yep, it's still gone. You go down through here. You had a read at, uh, I think that we said we had a read at, at uh, T13, for instance. And now it doesn't read, so that's reduced. And you come back here and, for instance, you've still got this one pesky uh, subluxation that won't seem to go away. 
You put motion into it, it reacts. You put motion into it again, it still reacts. You leave it alone because you put enough motion into it. It is a reduced subluxation. It's just an irritated, facilitated joint segment. And then you go back down through the dog, completing out the whole adjustment, basically wringing the dog out from point A to point B. And in so doing, then, you've made your third pass, and that usually is enough. Sometimes a fourth pass might be necessary, sometimes a fifth, fifth pass, but usually always just three passes, a diagnostic pass, a therapeutic pass, and then a pass to check that therapeutic pass. And that's the three approaches that we use in making a, basically a, an adjustment. It usually takes less than a minute to do all of these three adjustments. It takes a lot more time to explain what it is you're doing to the owner or what you're doing to the dog to the owner. Um, it becomes important to explain to people and for also for people who try to learn this technique to decide what it is that we're looking for when we're looking for a activator read or what we're looking for is a VOM read. And as we move down the dog's body, for instance, if we're, if we're moving down and we're adjusting these areas, what you'll do is you'll get almost no response or no response each time you put motion into the dorsal spinous process of these vertebrae. However, if you have a compromised joint, an angry facilitated joint segment, what will happen is when you put this motion in, you're going to get a reflexive response. A reflexive response will occur at the exact time a reflexive response would. For instance, a knee-jerk-like response occurs immediately, just like that. It isn't the dog going, oh, I heard a click, and turning around and saying, what the heck are you doing? It's not a dog that's going to react to the sound up there because their ear will twitch back and they'll look at you and they respond to the noise, but you can, tell, you can test that by doing this. It's a dog who has a non-voluntary re reflexive response associated with the neurological impulse that you place into the spinal cord with mechanoreceptor input by the activator device. The activator device is no different than taking um, a reflex device like this and whacking the patellar tendon. It, the reflex occurs at the ex precise time and as you get to use this technique more and more what you will realize is you'll be able to determine very easily what is a body response, what is a cognizant response by the dog, and also what is a reflexive response. The dog can't do anything about the reflexive response. All we're concerned about in the reflexive response is do we have a compromised or irritated joint segment that occurs at which particular spot and therefore we know when to put motion into that joint. It's also very important to realize that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create and put motion into the spinal process um, in such a fashion that it concurs motion to the mechanoreceptors of the facilitated segment and thereby reduces the subluxation. So now let's investigate the aspects of adjusting in the head and neck of the dog's neck and, and these particular aspects of the atlanto-occipital subluxation which is so important in veterinary orthopedic manipulation. As you can see, there are three different positions that we can use to adjust the dog in the atlanto-occipital area. The atlanto-occipital area can be <coughs> adjusted by putting motion into the occiput, the stylus process off the side of the occiput, or <coughs> excuse me, the um, lateral or the wing of what we call the atlas. The atlas is very, very large and wide, of course, in the canine as opposed to the human being, and it can be easily palpated. It's a means by which you can get a pretty good hold on these dogs sometimes, too, if you're trying to stabilize their head. Unfortunately, because of the wide wings of this atlas, you also have the effects of the collars and the choke collars producing a lot of effects in subluxation in the neck, and they go very much un, un, uh, unnoticed by people. So here again, the, uh, the contact point is here if you can get it to it here. It's here if you can't make that. And if you can't get in between this area from here and here, you basically palpate for the wing of the atlas, which I do quite frequently, and adjust this. A small dog such as a poodle or a cat, for instance, would be adjusted in this regard. And we go click like this. Now ordinarily, you don't have a pole sticking up in between this. And what I do is I usually run around here under with my hand and bring this thing up and adjust it from the other side, but it's kind of hard to do without standing in the way. But it comes in underneath like this, and the adjustment is made here, like that. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a, a number of other types of, of adjustments that can occur, but basically the atlanto-cervical, the atlanto-occipital subluxation is finished off by putting motion into the dorsal spinous process 
of the second cervical vertebra, like this. And this is what occurs. This is what happens when you're not supposed to lose your head. So don't let your head be lost. So what's occurring here is you're basically driving, you're basically driving the lateroccipital junction up like this, and then like this, up from one side, and then up the other side. And then by bringing the pressure down here, uh, the dorsal aspect of the second cervical vertebra, you're bringing the dens, there's no, <laughs> there's no piece of wire in there obviously, but you bring the dens down and it forces itself against the bottom of the um, uh, second or the first uh, cervical vertebra and brings this thing back into play correctly. Let's see if we can put him back together again. Okay. He's going to hang in there for a few minutes. Now, it's imperative to note <clears throat> that when you do have a pet that has this dens that sticks out in this area and it matriculates over this part of the area right here of the first cervical vertebra. What you're endeavoring to do is you're endeavoring to bring this whole sequence, sequence down and bring this down after you've pushed it all up. So you pushed it up to the right, up to the left, now it's up, and now you're going to bring it down. You can't really put pressure on this because it's covered up by the dorsal aspect of the second um, cervical vertebra. So you bring that down, and that transfers the pressure to the dens, which then brings the whole section back down again. And so that is the aspect of the adjustment of the <clears throat> cervical vertebra of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the lateroccipital junction of the canine and uh, the beginning of the activator pass. Now as we move into the cervical vertebra, very commonly it's difficult to get after the third cervical vertebra, but you very commonly can. Even if you're just moving and you're working on the neutral ligament or the ligament, yellow ligament, um, you're basically able to put motion into this joint and get a read necessarily, and that's fine. You're trying to hit the dorsal spinous process, and keep in mind that uh, when all else fails, the line of drive is towards the center of the earth, but in this case, it's very often just perpendicular to the spinal length of the spinal cord, so it's like this, boom, boom, boom. Now, what will happen is there's be a lot of tissue involved right in here, and you can't get in that very well because it'll actually be between the two, the two uh, wings of the scapula. And so the scapula will be in there. And so you'll actually actually have to take your, your activator and put it in between the wings of the, the two wings of the scapula and get it down to a contact point to fire it off like that. Now keep in mind, one of the more common areas of subluxation occur at the only primary spot, of, I'm a, the only secondary curve that the canine has. The canine essentially bends in a primary curve like this, except for one secondary curve, which occurs in the neck in this area right in here. And this is where a dogs, have, dogs have a serious amount of subluxation that go undiagnosed. They go undiagnosed because they very commonly put pressure on the tracks of the spinal cord in this area that cause rear leg lameness. And that rear leg nameless, lameness basically goes as rear leg lameness and nobody thinks to look in the neck. However, the adjustment or the activator device diagnostic pass and adjustment occurs in this area here and keep in mind from this point at C6 you start to move back towards the head like this until finally C7 is, is, is activated in this fashion and C8 is activated like this where T1 is activated like that. Very commonly you can get a read at T2 too because it involves um, the um, input into the brachial plexus. Now, as I mentioned, the area from T3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, um, actually from 3 until about 6, is almost uh, adjustment no man land. We very rarely get an adjustment in that area. Very commonly when I make a diagnostic pass, I will place my activator in this area and fire it off one time uh, just to see if I get a read there whatsoever. Uh, sometimes I'll get a read there. There won't be a subluxation. There'll be something else that's going on with these dogs. They'll have an incredible itchy skin phenomenon or something else will be going on. And I'll get a read in there <coughs> where I'll get uh, false reads all up and down the back. These would be dogs that would be like severely atopic, in other words, itchy skin dogs. 
and they would read in that area, but very, very seldom because of the transverse ligament that goes from rib head to rib head. We very commonly don't end up with subluxations in that area because of the stability and lack of motion that occur in that area. So we basically don't see a lot of subluxation in this area. The line of drive is down the length of the <clears throat> dorsal spinous process. So as you can see, it starts to lean back as we go to here. But what we're interested in is we're go interested in going down to about C6 or C7. And at that point, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we check that out. We want to make sure that we check out at least C7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, C or T10, T7, 8, 9, and 10, T7, 8, 9, and 10 are adjusted in this di di uh, direction necessarily. And in a larger dog, they're often very much further apart and easier to delineate. In a smaller dog, sometimes you'll end up getting one or two of them in at the same adjustment. These particular, um, these particular subluxations are important in dogs such as German Shepherds who may be developing a problem in their hips or degenerative myelopathy or other diseases. We don't see these particular subluxations very commonly in dogs unless they're predisposed to problems that are going to occur in the hips. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, then we get down onto the areas where we're about at T11, T12, T13, and L1. And these all, even though they are rib-oriented areas, I'm talking about T10, 11, 12, and 13. I'm sorry, 10, 11, 12, and 13. They all have the transverse ligament that runs from the uh, rib head to the other rib head. They still act almost like lumbar vertebra. And so they um, are real prone to subluxation in this area. It is kind of a transition zone from the thoracic vertebra to the lumbar vertebra that produce a number of potential subluxations. Usually they begin at T13L1 and move forward and caudal. The majority of subluxations that is found by the VOM practitioner are found in the lumbar vertebra. And they're found by activating the dorsal spinous process of the lumbar vertebra, as we've shown before. And very commonly, you'll see these subluxations picking up at about T13, L1. And so here's T13, the last rib. It's the anticlinal vertebra. And after that, we don't have this transverse ligament that's stabilizing these, uh, these joints. And they're predisposed to lots and lots of torsion, twisting, and subluxation. So very, very much you get the L, uh, L1, L2 subluxation, and you're going to be adjusting in this regard. Click, click, click. Very commonly, you'll get like L1, L2. It'll skip, a sub, it'll skip a vertebra, and you'll get L3 or L4. Very commonly, also, you'll see L4 and L5 will give you a subluxation. Now, here we have L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here is 4, 5. And this is a real common one. The genitofemoral nerve comes out from this area, runs down the leg, etc., and also goes to the genital area and produces a lot of havoc. So we very commonly see an L4, 5 subluxation. The angle of drive is almost straight up and down for L4, 5, L4 and L5. Okay? When we take and we get a reaction on the L4, by the way, that is called an adjustment at L4, 5. Okay? And so that's really what's actually occurring. On the fourth lumbar vertebra, we can see that I have delineated some other contact points. You have rather extensive transverse processes that come out, and you can. Uh, and mammillary processes that come up, and you can contact these points sometimes and move these points. The activator point um, that you would move would be almost straight up and down, if not a little bit towards the, the center of the pet like this. And the mammillary process is activated almost coming back in this regard. Now, we don't, using this device, use these approaches very much because we don't have to. Although it's used a lot in, in human medicine, we don't use it in veterinary medicine because we don't necessarily need to. This is all the adjustment that you need to put into that whole joint. And that's what makes veterinary orthopedic manipulation a rather easy technique to apply. Again then, the mammillary process is adjusted in this fashion. The transverse process is adjusted in, excuse me, in this fashion. And of course, the dorsal spinous process is adjusted in this fashion. Oops, looks like I broke his back. Now, in adjusting the pelvis, as, a, as you note, there are three contact points. Very commonly, the one, the dorsal, spot, the dorsal process of the ilium will be the one that you'll be able to feel. And you'll want to put your fingers on both sides to make sure we're nice and straight and even, and whether or not we have the pelvis even in general. 
but it gives you an idea whether the pelvis is twisted or crooked or what have you. But what you want to do is you're looking for a, an activator, a activator pass or diagnostic pass response, and you'll place this on the top of the wing of the ilium and do this. This is for the diagnostic pass. Then you'll do the contralateral side in the exact same fashion with the same line of drive relative to that hemipelvis. The next response would be to go to the ischial area on the same on the contralateral side, and then a contralateral ischial area, for instance, determining which one of those in fact read. So the subluxations of the diagnostic pass in the in the pelvis would go from here to here, and then here in here. Now as you notice there are three different positions that I've delineated and those are for, for adjusting. Sometimes you'll find that a pelvis will be driven down on one side, up on the other side. You may want to bring the pelvis and you can actually get up underneath the pelvis and make an adjustment like that. Or you'll find that the hemipelvis is moved forward in relative to the other one and you may want to bring it back in this fashion by putting it pressure that way and bringing it back in that regard. And so the straightening out of the pelvis in the canine and also in the feline is actually quite easy to do. As I've mentioned, the diagnostic pass takes only a few seconds to do. It takes probably a minute to a minute and a half to adjust the dog from stem to stern. And, and uh, the dogs take it quite easily. It doesn't hurt the dog and doesn't harm the dog. There are very few things that you can do with an activator outside of throwing it across the room and wanking the dog on the side of the head that will hurt the dog with the activator device. The activator device just puts motion into the uh, spinal segment that's compromised. And if it's compromised, it then becomes reduced. You can continue to um, uh, adjust uh, a joint, but it's not going to get any better after a certain point. And that you will learn with clinical application. Um, after your first 20 or so adjustments, it's very, very easy to understand the things that I have shown you. The activator points that we have uh, tried to point out with uh, this technique and this video um, are for demonstration purposes and should help you um, adjust to larger and smaller dogs and even cats. Essentially for cats, the, uh, land, uh, the landmarks are relatively the same, so you should be able to find them quite easily. There has been some question as to whether or not there should be an adjustment at the temporomandibular joint. The temporomandibular joints in the canine usually don't get messed up too much because the jaw is so long and the interdigitation of the teeth, the canine teeth essentially are such, it keeps the jaw relatively in um, uh, good uh, articular co contact. However, the line of adjustment involves one of two motions and that's a lateral adjustment click and also an adjustment down the ramus of the mandible like this click. And so we have those two adjustments. You want to do that on both sides. It's very common that we have, very uncommon that we have to adjust the mandible and the temporomandibular joint of the canine. In the cases of the proptosed or the prolapsed discs, we have a diagram here which will explain essentially what's occurring in the back of the dog when we have a ruptured or a, spl or a blown disc. Blown disc disease or intervertebral disc disease very commonly seen in the canine and it's one of the more common disease conditions that you'll see as a clinical practice. Here we have a normal case where the, the spinal cord in blue is um, basically um, normal in this case. And of course, the, um, the nucleus pulposus is sitting there, and, and the ambulance fibrosis is sitting there, and life is beautiful. In the case of the prolapse disc, you have two different situations. You have a condition where the, the material is blasted up into the spinal cord, causing pressure on the spinal cord, and there are subsequent problems that occur down the line. Now, this also occurs in the neck area and will commonly cause lamenesses in the rear leg. This type of thing occurs in the neck quite commonly and will cause pressure on the spinal cord, and these tracks then correspond to rear leg lameness. And so the problem is in the neck, but we end up with what appears to be rear leg lame lameness problems. The other condition is where we actually have a ruptured or prolapsed disc where it blows out and it starts to put pressure on the nerve root the nerve root as it comes out of the spinal vertebra and that then causes a peripheral nerve damage and that peripheral nerve damage will then cause that particular nerve root to compromise and cause whatever feeds that nerve root or that nerve root feeds will, will be then compromised. Notice the spinal cord in this case is essentially normal. Um, that particular type of injury occurs actually in the lower back and the lumbar vertebra. 
I'd like to thank you for your patience and, and letting me go through this and show um, these particular activator points to you. And uh, I'd have you um, stay tuned as I'll give you some more data on actual application of uh, adjusting on the live animal. And thank you. Good. Now, let's discuss the radiographic aspects of veterinary chiropractic care. Several, several years ago, I was made aware that a lot of chiropractors back in 1983 were not using radiographic evidence to make their diagnosis. These are chiropractors, not veterinarians. And veterinarians all have to have an x-ray, and most chiropractors do too. Chiropractic care does not necessarily require an x-ray. However, veterinary chiropractic care may very well benefit from uh, radiographic evidence, and I'll explain why that is. In the aspects of application of veterinary chiropractic care, one is being approached by a client that basically has a problem in one shape or form or another, and that problem is a medical problem. Therefore, a client approaching you with a medical problem for, um, with a, a pet in some regard is, is trying to ask you or to petition you to solve a medical problem. That is, by all definitions, the practice of veterinary medicine, and so as you apply your medical approach, veterinary chiropractic care, you um, will also be criticized by other practitioners perhaps if you have done a complete job. One could always be criticized as to whether or not <clears throat> a pet was showing clinical signs or symptomology because of a fracture, because of another diagnostic condition that would show up on x-ray, and also the possibility or presence of a tumor or a misdiagnosis. And because of that, one needs to be make, make one needs to make everyone aware of the fact that that has been ruled out. So um, radiographic evidences for um, a veterinary chiropractic care serves a number of different types of uh, solutions. The solutions that they provide are one, it enhances diagnosis and can make the diagnosis, although not necessarily inclusively makes the diagnosis. Two, it allows you to find out what was occurring in the past on the pet, and, um, and three, allows you to prognose what's going to occur in, occur in the future. These three things are the most three important reasons for you to um, x-ray a, uh, a pet that comes to your care if you possibly can. We're usually talking about small animals now, dogs and cats. And there's a fourth reason, or fourth uh, reason that you would do um, an x-ray of, of a pet that produces with a, a clinical problem. And that would be, of course, to make sure that you covered your backside in case someone else would criticize you, perhaps, that you did not take an x-ray. And, oh, by the way, that dog perhaps has a tumor, but he didn't x-ray it, so um, he's actually, that's not a, a good approach. It is a sad state of affairs when we have to um, apply our technology in this regard, making sure that we keep ourselves protected from other colleagues, most of which would be quite jealous of our success, to make sure that we are practicing in a fashion that is ethical and also is professionally um, complete. But nonetheless, this is one of the reasons, too, that we take x-rays. Now, we will find a number of different things that are valuable information for uh, radiographic evidence, and I'll go over some of them. The nature of this preliminary information is just a general overview. At a later date, I'll have a video that will extensively cover a number of different types of techniques and a number of different types of diseases and presentations and radiographic findings associated with specific disease conditions. But for all intents and purposes right now, I'd like to rule out the three or four different situations that are problem areas involving veterinary chiropractic care that the veterinarian and the chiropractor should make sure that they avoid and to make sure that they do in fact get radiographic evidence to um, rule out these particular disease conditions. <clears throat> the first condition is the misdiagnosis. There are four or five of these conditions. We'll go over them quickly, but I will explain them as we go along. The first condition is the misdiagnosis. Now this um, little dachshund 
presented paralyzed to a veterinary surgeon and um, the dog couldn't walk. The veterinary surgeon x-rayed this dog and the veterinary surgeon also myelogrammed this dog and was unable to find anything wrong. The dog still could not walk and uh, two or three weeks later the dog came to me. So what we did with these cases, and by the way all these cases will have been to other veterinarians and veterinary surgeons before they got to me, but uh, two to three weeks later this, uh, these clients presented themselves to me with this dog and uh, we of course then looked at the previous x-rays and we were able to find something wrong on the previous x-rays that the previous veterinarian did not find. We then took our own x-rays and we were able to find a number of clinical disease conditions. Um, if, for instance, you can see in this x-ray here in the thoracic vertebra, we see a calcified and collapsed disc here. This one also has collapsed radiographically. This one's questionable. This one also has collapsed. Now, when we do a radiographic, uh, and when we do an activator read, we get a read across the top here, here, and also right here. Um, this dog has uh, a blown disc. The disc is blown at this point. You can't see it, and this is a calcified disc in that particular area. A close-up of that disc shows this calcification right here. Now, this calcified material has squirted up into the spinal cord at this level here, causing pressure on the spinal cord and causing this dog to have an acute paralysis. This dog, with veterinary orthopedic manipulation, uh, responded quite favorably over the next three or four weeks, and after four months, this dog could walk normally. Albeit, the dog had a little bit of a hitch in its get-along, as my mom would say, but nonetheless, the dog was, able, was ambulatory and had bowel and bladder function. This dog was activated and showed a read here, here. This area was, which is the um, area just caudal to the blown disc, was dead and did not respond whatsoever, and then reacted here, didn't react here, and then in this area where there's some shot, if you'll notice there's some lead shot in this dog at this level, which is not causing a problem. There was no reaction here, but there was also subluxation at here, and actually this intervertebral disc here is somewhat collapsed and compromised too. And so that was the diagnostic blueprint that allowed us to treat that dog. The second case, or second type of case that you should be always aware of to x-ray when you get into your care is this particular case. Now you can see from the x-ray that this dog has got a problem. However, this dog presented to the veterinary surgeon with soreness in the back and some limping in the, in the, in the left and right rear legs. Um, this dog was then given a myelogram and after the myelogram, this dog was paralyzed, totally paralyzed, and was for about four to six weeks. In four to six weeks, we got a chance to see that. Now, this dog was obviously paralyzed by the myelogram, and since the veterinary surgeon in this area was <clears throat> uh, the big dog, so to speak, um, he didn't get in any trouble for it. You can bet that if I came along and changed the diagnosis and perhaps shifted the responsibility back onto that practitioner that, she, that I could get into a heck of a lot of trouble. So here again, radiographic evidence to support my point of view certainly has to be done to keep yourself basically on the straight and narrow. You can see obviously delineated by the arrows the areas of, of subluxation and collapsed disc and ebernation. And these areas, of course, have occurred because of recurrent subluxation. We're talking about the areas here, here, and here. There are also other areas throughout the back that have shown um, subluxation from a very chiropractic adjustment, uh, diagnostic pass. Um, this dog, we adjusted for about a month and a half, and the dog resumed normal function. And uh, this dog didn't show any clinical signs of lameness after that. But the dog was totally paralyzed after the myelogram. You can perhaps imagine what my idea is about myelography. Myelography is only necessary if in fact you're going to do surgery. That's the only reason to do myel myelography. If, the, if you're not going to do surgery, then you have no business doing myelogram. The um, vert uh, VD of this dog shows that there are collapsed discs in that area uh, that are showing up in the uh, above x-ray. But here we go, we have the collapsed discs. And the VD x-ray is sometimes very commonly not very demonstrable for a lot of conditions. The lateral is usually uh, uh, the most valuable one. However, you need to take a VD to um, get a comparison. In this case, we are uh, um, able to verify that we do have the collapsed discs because we see them in the VD. It's interesting to examine radiographically the, uh, <clears throat> the cervical vertebra of this dog because you can see that there is a number of proliferations 
and collapses at the caudal cervical area, here, here, here. And these conditions also would cause this dog to have clinical problems. It was probably the combination of these conditions that led to this dog's rear leg lameness that the veterinarian was doing a caudal myelogram to try to determine had he done an anterior myelogram from the um, foramen magna back here and to done a myelogram in this area, he may have seen some compromised um, uh, spinal cord impingement at this area. But the dog only had rear leg lameness. It becomes very obvious from the VD of the skull, the skull being here, of course, and the atlanto-occipital junction being right here, that this dog's neck is pretty well tweaked to the side. The atlanto-occipital junction is compromised in this fashion, and the second cervical vertebra is twisted in this fashion, too. So this dog required a good deal of adjustments in the head. We basically gave this dog an AOLA, an AORA adjustment, and adjusted the dog at the lower base of the caudal, uh, caudal cervical area, along with the lower back, to get this dog straightened out. And this dog also responded quite favorably. Well, the last case was a case of where a practitioner did not apply a technology and the dog got into trouble, and also when one of his diagnostic procedures, in this case a myelogram, also caused a problem, which unfortunately does occur, and it's an occupational hazard or a professional hazard. Here's a situation where um, a practitioner, in order to save this animal's life, put in, um, a, obviously, a bone plate, and um, this dog was okay. Then this, this same practitioner, a fantastic practitioner, by the way, saved this dog's life, but uh, close to eight or nine months later, this dog presented with a new set of clinical problems, and uh, I'll explain why. You can see, obviously, that there is a broken um, screw and there are a number of broken screws as we pan through this situation. We can see that a couple of them are busted. One, there's one there and another one there, and they start to migrate and put pressure on the spinal cord. Um, here again, this plate was necessary to save this dog's life. However, the intervertebral discs and the uh, joints, caudal and cranial, to the plate take on all the biomechanical stress of this dog's back and unfortunately produce a subluxation phenomenon that occurs at the end. I'll show you where those align. This dog showed severe sub subluxation at this point here, of course, but also showed no subluxation there, and this is the joint that was collapsing and showing a problem, this one and this one. This one and these two were actually the ones that were the problems. Not to mention that as we look at the other end of the spinal cord, we'll see that we're dealing with collapsed and compromised discs here and here and here. When we look at the VD of this pet, we can see that this plate, which was placed on the left lateral side of the spinal vertebra in the thoracic area, that there are, in fact, a bunch of things floating around. And this is, unfortunately, that which we um, inherit when we have to do surgery. Surgery is always going to cause a problem. In this case, it solved the dog's life. However, as a veterinary chiropractitioner, what you have to do is you have to make sure that you cover your backside because you're going in and you're actually trying to repair a problem that has been caused by an albeit life-saving procedure, but nonetheless a procedure, real expensive procedure, by another practitioner. So you have to make sure that you have radiographic evidence to bear out and support what it is that you're finding and what it is that you're treating. This golden retriever presented to a veterinary radiologist and a veterinary surgeon for a neck and lower back pain and was x-rayed by extensively by both radiologists and um, uh, veterinary surgeon alike. And they were unable to find a whole lot of evidence as to why this dog had this problem until they finally x-rayed the dog from the lateral side. As you can see, this dog is significantly bent in the neck area. This is as straight as we can get this dog. This dog is being x-rayed under anesthesia. Um, and is obviously bowing from one side to the other with quite a serious little bow at this area. And that's as straight as we can get the anesthetized dog, which is, uh, shows um, active areas of muscle spasming on this side. As we further examine the atlanto-occipital area, we find that on one side we're relatively open, but on the other side we're seriously closed down. This dog has an AORA, a right atlanto-occipital subluxation, and 
basically this is a dog that is jerked on a chain on a regular basis. Nice dog, uh, um, but this dog still has serious problems. When this dog presented with me, it had a lot more neck pain, but a lot more back pain and didn't quite fit the pattern of clinical signs and symptomology that we would expect for a dog with a right atlanto-occipital subluxation. Um, so we, of course, x-rayed it, and this is what we found on the lateral x-ray. On the lateral x-ray, we were able to see a serious amount of um, osteophytes that were created between the first and, I'm sorry, the second and third joint space. Here's the uh, occiput, the first and second, so it's between the first and second, rather. There was some proliferation lower down, but this is what we found to be the situation. We were a little bit concerned about what that might be. Of course, we also have a dog that had serious um, amounts of uh, pain in the lower back, too, which didn't make a lot of sense. Keep in mind that pain in the neck and subluxations occurring anywhere in the neck can manifest themselves further on down the line. Um, this condition, as you see, is significant, and both the radiologist and the veterinary surgeon got a chance to look at this and decide what they were going to do, and they decided that th their decision at the time was not to do surgery at this particular time. Um, the dog continued to go downhill for the next three or four weeks, and then I got a chance to um, see the case. When I saw the case, the dog had uh, subluxations in this area, so we would uh, go through and we'd get a read here, and we'd get a read here, for instance. But uh, when we got down to the lower back and we started to activate the area in the lower back, the dog screeched out in excruciating pain. Okay, well, similar x-rays to these were taken about three or four weeks ahead of, before I got a chance to take these films. The dog was painful in that area, of course, in the lower back, but it seemed to have most of its pain in the neck area. Um, as you can see in this x-ray, um, there's a black line listed, which obviously is where the problem is, but we're looking for uh, subluxations throughout the lower back, and as we move through the lower back, we are able to get very little, if any, adjustment of response here, 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 here. We start to pick something up. And then here, the dog drops in excruciating pain as soon as we put uh, activation into this area. And then in here, the dog turns around and tries to rip our legs off. This is a golden retriever that is biting for real. This dog is in excruciating pain. There's something going on. Now, when you run across a case like this where the dog is trying to bite you fiercely because he's trying to defend himself, you should stop and ask yourself, what is going on here? If you have a dog that you are basically going over as in a diagnostic pass and find this type of response, you should hit the brakes and ask yourself, whoa, we need to get a film. We need to get a film. Now, this dog was manifesting this problem and went to two other very, very qualified professionals, and when they did so, they missed it and this dog continued to have this problem. Showed up on my doorstep, and when I found this kind of response, I had seen it before, and I started to look very intensively for what was going on in this dog's back. Let's look a little care more carefully to this one area. Right in about here. What is it that we see? I'll delineate that perhaps a bit better. You see a kind of a punched out area right around here, circumscribed in this area here. And that, of course, is a tumor, an extra capsular tumor, an extra medullary tumor growing, causing acute pain on the nerve root. And when you go in with the activator and you create pressure up in this area, this is about the only time that you can hurt an animal. You can't really hurt them, but, it, boy, it smarts. When you do that, it puts pressure on that area and causes acute pain. This dog has a tumor. Unfortunately for the dog, and unfortunately for the owner, it was unable to be operated on, and the dog had to be put to sleep. The area in the, the, area in the neck that was examined and ruled out as bony proliferation uh, by the previous practitioners was also found on autopsy to be part of the tumor. Um, it didn't seem to um, come from a primary bone tumor, but in the fact, the lower back was a tumor, and this area also was a tumor, and I think it was a lymphosarcoma. Um, so this was an unfortunate situation for this beautiful dog and the family that owned it. Fortunately or unfortunately, these cases come from other practitioners, and because they come from other practitioners, we have uh, a responsibility to make a complete diagnosis. That complete diagnosis, very commonly, will in involve an activator pass, a diagnostic pass, 
and also sometimes radiographic evidence to back up our diagnosis and to make sure that we're not missing something. Probably the worst nightmare would be missing a tumor that's growing because very commonly a dog will respond positively to an adjustment even if they have a tumor like the one that we've just seen. The unfortunate situation is that you're not doing anything for that dog, you're not even um, except for postponing the inevitable and there is a possibility that quick surgical intervention could have taken care of a situation like this. In this case, however, it was not the situation. So in retrospect, the cases that come from other practitioners that have been operated on or not operated on or have had some sort of diagnostic intervention that are producing other clinical signs or cases that come to you for second opinions or cases that come to you for second opinions without the blessing of the previous veterinary practitioner